I too am going to start with a quote. As, uh, as Phil was talking, I just I remembered it. Um, I just want to read out a quote to you. Um, Sydney is a small area and not particularly rich from the growing point of view, yet it produced three quarters of the state's lettuces, half the spinach, a third of the cabbages and, three, and a quarter of the beans. Seventy per cent of the state's poultry farms were in the county and more than 18 per cent of Sydney's milk came from the county. The preservation of farms and market gardens is therefore of considerable importance for the well-being of Sydney as well as for the economy of the state. Rural production in, the, in Sydney has always played an important part in supplying food for Sydney and the advantage is a proximity to the largest market in Australia with more than, more than compensating for the somewhat poor soil conditions. Can anyone tell me who said that and when? Was it, it was a guy called Professor Dennis Winston. He was the Professor of Architecture and Planning at Sydney University and this was written in 1957. And I've actually, he actually put the county in there, not Sydney. Um, I love, ag, what was it, agri... Agvocacy. Ag, agri agvocacy. My name's Ian Sinclair. I'm an agrivocate. <laughs> or an advocate. Agrivocate. Yeah, that's too hard to say. <laughs> Don't let me have anything to drink. I'll slur it all over the place. Okay, just let me find the presentation. Um, for those of you that know me and have seen me present, I've only got 22 slides this evening, so... I'm going to whip through them because I do, we, do want to, we do want to hear you talk and hear you ask us questions and, and, and that sort of thing. So uh, Australia, sorry, I'll get a pr proper map of Australia. There's a better map of Australia. There's our food growing areas in Australia and as you can see, the actual food growing areas, the good food land is actually the soils basically are on the edge here. Um, um, Professor Henry Nix did a study of Australia's soils in the 1970s and he reckoned it was 10% arable land mass. If you go to the FAO's website, the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organisation, they've actually done an analysis of all the world's uh, arable land. Worldwide, the arable land is 10%. Australia is now quoted as 5.7% of the arable land is, 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 a, is, a, is, uh, is arable uh, land mass. Now there's our population density. I'm going to go backwards. Where's page up? There we go. Yeah, it's not working. There we go, that one. That one. See the difference? Similarities? Differences? Similarities? Where's our food grown? The inland areas, the Murray-Darling Basin, South Australia and Western Australia. This is where the grain, the fibre, the vegetables, uh, vineyards, orchards, etc. Sheep and cattle and pigs and poultry come from. Metropolitan Fringe, I think uh, Phil and I need to, uh, need to check our figures and, uh, and have a bit of a chat about it, is a significant producer of perishable vegetables, vineyards, poultry, specialised niche agriculture. Everyone's been telling us for the past 10 years, especially as the, uh, as the city dwellers have finally realised that there was a drought happening. I too, have a, we, ha we grew up, when I was growing up, my family had a farm at Willow Tree on the Liverpool Plains. I know what the Liverpool Plains is like. I also know about the third tap in the kitchen. The third tap in the kitchen was the bore water tap. You never, if you put the bore, if you put the rainwater tap into the uh, to the washing up, your your life wasn't worth living. Um, droughts occur all the time, but suddenly people in Sydney are starting to realise that droughts occur. Um, everyone was telling us that the the, uh, the Murray Darling Basin was the uh, the food bowl of Australia. It's not the food bowl. It's a food bowl. This is some analysis that I've done. I've gone through the ABS agricultural statistics for all of the production of perishable vegetables, broken it down into kilograms and aggregated it. And that's the figures there. 63% of the perishable vegetables grown in New South Wales come from the metropolitan area, the Sydney Statistical Division. Adding them all together, it's 68% of Australia's perishable vegetables come from the metropolitan fringe and coastal areas of Queensland. There's a map showing what it is. So there's the, uh, the perishable vegetables. Now I want you to have a look at, I'm doing some work up in the Whitsundays at the moment and I can tell you what, it's wonderful going up to the Whitsundays region in winter because you start to get into shorts as you get up there. Um, and that's got Bowen and Proserpine in it, which are very significant agricultural areas, and they're up in the top there. But if we then have a look at the, the population growth, you can see that we've created, we have what I call a contested landscape there. The population project, everything above, every, everything above green, green, yellow, 
um, orange and red is much higher than the Australian average population growth, which is 1.3%. So you can see the, 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 the Bowen area, the, um, t sorry, the Mackay area, in, up in the, this area here, have a look at that, then we go here. It's one of the highest growing, highest, there's one tomato producer up there that sends 800,000 10 kilo boxes of tomatoes out of his packing shed every year, and that's one of them, and he's one of the smaller ones. So, agriculture on the fringe, as we've been saying, it's a billion dollar a year industry. Now, the spooky thing about it is have a look at New South Wales, Victoria, and Queensland. 13% of the value of each of those areas and very minuscule amount of the land. New South Wales, Queensland and Victoria also are 78.7% of the population and are growing at a 1.6% per annum. Remember the previous slide, 1.3% is the Australian average. Here's, the, uh, here's the, 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 the graph showing you the statistics. Have a look at the Sydney region on the left and the Murray and Murray and Murrumbidgee, Murray and Murrumbidgee on the right. That's what we expect to see for vegetables. When we break it down into the perishables, though, we see the dominance of the Sydney Basin. Now let's have a look at Sydney region. This is the numbers, the actual numbers there. I'm sure the, the presentation will be made available, so you don't need to look at that. But what I want you to have a look at is the land use. Oh, do you want to go back? Okay. All right. Can I have another minute while they look at that, please, Costa? <laughs> okay, we're going forward, sorry. I've done a land use survey. I've actually driven around every block of land in, New in Western Sydney and driven past every house, well, I won't say every, I'll, I'll, be, I'll, be, I'll use the conservative academic thing and say probably 90% of the houses I've driven past, and I've actually plotted them on a map and added them all up. 78.3% of the land use is rural residential, but it produces a billion dollars a year of agriculture with a multiplier conservatively of four to five, maybe, maybe six. So that's, let's, let's be conservative again, $4 billion it puts into the New South the Sydney economy, but it's coming from a very small land base. Rural land use conflict occurs. Um, the people that live on a rural residential block, and I'm not there's anything wrong with it, um, but the people that live on a rural residential block, they have a new type of recreation. It's called recreational lawn mowing. Has any, put up your hand if you've ever mown a lawn at night on one of the rider ponds, actually lawn tractors at night. Anyone ever done it? Why do they have headlights? It's, it's a bloke thing. The person that lives here is a recreational lawnmower. They complained about the farmer next door. They, they were saying, they were quoted in the newspaper, this is in Wallandilly where I used to work. They, used, they were saying that the, uh, the, the lady was saying that she feared for the health of her unborn child because of the, uh, the, the spray drift that was going to, because we have a, a tank water system, don't you know? We don't like you people in the city that have the, the, the reticulated water. Um, we actually pulled the BA for the house and found that it actually had a first flush system, so she didn't really understand what she was talking about. See the poultry farm? Now, McDonald's don't have to go far for the egg and bacon McNuckins or the chicken McNuggets. And that's what it looks like. There is a term in planning called existing use rights. He has existing use rights. He can stay for as long as... He's even, he's even now got a farm gate sale from his place. Um, having worked in Wallandilly, I can tell you that uh, there is, Wallandilly has the most turkeys of any local government area in the country. <laughs> and because I spent eight and a half years as a strategic planning manager there, I can tell you that some of those turkeys are the feathered variety. The guy that lives here used to live here. He sold that, built this, then started complaining about the poultry farm. This is the farmer's revenge. Now, as you can see, he needs to put spell check over his paintbrush. <laughs> um, and as you can tell, if you're a keen uh, person with the red pen, he can't spell neighbours. This was taken in the United States. Um, the sign down here actually says, commie planning zoners, nice people welcome, sorry, commie planning zoners don't. Not. It's the other side of it. When you are faced with rural land use conflict as a farmer, you just want to say, you know, the bird, show the person the bird. And I'm not talking about the fluttering things, and that, that sort of bird. Um, so, the community is also very concerned with what we're dealing with. We have the cave people, the citizens against virtually everything. Then we have a dude, a developer under delusionary expectations. And when the cave people meet the dudes, you get a Lulu, a locally unwanted land use. And the political response is Nimtu, not in my term of office. <laughs> this is what we deal with. So, if we want to think of food, 
It's a necessity of life, as Cost has said. It needs, it needs land, water and food to, land and water to grow, and that brings us to locational factors. If we want to think about the locational factors of food, we have land, water, climate, soils and nutrients, economic development, infrastructure, labour force and markets. It needs certainty, it needs minimal risks, and, it needs, and that leads us to food, risk, food production risk factors. The food production risk factors are natural hazards, floods, cyclones and drought. We then have the climate change, variability, sea rise, sea level rise and ocean acidification. Then we have competition and rural land use conflict, which is urbanisation, rural residential, environmental protection and coal and gas. They're the issues that we need to think about when we're talking about planning for food. So, food is important. It is a necessity of life. Traditionally, it's been grown on the edge of our, uh, our cities and towns. What we need to do is we need to provide for more food for the growing population, but the good land is being paved over. Planning for food security is not being given a high agenda on the planning on the, uh, sorry, on the agenda of planning or governments. Priority has been given to water, housing, environmental awareness and social issues. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but um, my dad was a veterinary, uh, an academic in veterinary parasitology and he used to say, never knock a farmer with your mouth full or a woolen jumper on. We haven't been given, we've been mostly ignored it. We've started to address it, the Metro plan and the previous Metro strategy have addressed it, but we haven't seen the right number, amount of resources put to the people in the agencies to try and to give them the resources to do it. So, planning is not about predicting the future, it's about being prepared for it. The way we get prepared for it is understand what's happening. So, we need policy and regulation, we need economic development incentives and infrastructure, we need community engagement, communication and education, but more importantly, we need to develop um, sort of policies and projects which link all those together. So, what we do, we do, we do policy and regulation really well. Everyone thinks, oh, we'll just zone it. That's easy. That's what the government department's planning says. We'll just zone it, that'll fix it. It won't fix it because we need to give economic development incentives and infrastructure. We need to engage with the community. We need to get good and meaningful data. So, planning is needed for food security. We've got to have a multifaceted approach. We need good and meaningful data. Political and dollar commitment, statutory incentives and education all need to be considered. We need to involve the players in the discussions now and investigations and we need a food strategy for Sydney. Really, or a food land strategy, I think, is what is needed because a food strategy for, for Australia is too big to cover under one document. I think we need to break it down into the component parts. Um, we need to make some decisions now and not leave it till it's too late. I reckon we can grow food and grow houses and achieve a sustainable food, future food security. Otherwise, it might end up like this. Thank you.